That's correct. Uh, I hope that folks can hear me. Uh, this is Charlie Canham. I'm at the Cary Institute. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about this report that Thomas and I uh, uh, did uh, over the past year and a half uh, with Steve Hamburg from uh, Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and, and this is really a broad overview of uh, the potential for biomass energy in the Northeast. Um, and we wanted to take a step back and look at um, both opportunities and constraints. Um, there's been a lot of excitement about this uh, for lots of good reasons. Um, and I think we went into this um, with just the hope that we could provide a regional perspective. I think you'll find that some of our results were a little surprising. Uh, they were certainly perhaps even a little depressing to some of us. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to make sure I actually, so I have to, I guess I have to. Um, uh, this is just a, a set of links to the report and to some press briefings about it. Um, I, I assume you all can get access to that. Um, but we're going to cover five basic questions today. I'm going to cover the first three, and then Thomas is going to talk about the, uh, the last two. And so mine really uh, are an attempt to try to um, address what I tend to think of as perception versus reality in the northeastern U.S. Um, the public seems to have all sorts of ideas about the nature of forest resources and how we use them um, that don't always uh, jive with what's actually out there. And so that's, uh, that's what I'm going to try to cover. And an awful lot of what I will present is based on a, a data source that I, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with. This is the uh, Forest Service FIA, Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, uh, the network of permanent sample points uh, distributed uh, actually across the U.S. Uh, we've been working with the data from the nine northeastern states. And um, I, I suspect most of you are familiar with the design of this. These plots are remeasured um, at um, somewhat regular intervals, although uh, the intervals actually vary a bit. Uh, typically, the goal is around every five years, but in practice, it's more like every five to eight years under current standards. Uh, but it is a remarkable resource uh, if you want to get a big picture. The density of the plots is frankly too low to be used to manage any particular piece of plot, a piece of uh, uh, tract of land, or even at, almost at the county level. But at the state level or above, it's an invaluable resource. For instance, this is a, a map that actually each one of those dots that you hopefully are seeing is, is in fact, one of the FIA plots. And I've just color coded them uh, to show the variation in total above ground biomass. This is so the biomass of trees. And the, uh, I will use uh, metric units throughout. Um, and, and you can you get a sense, for instance, that the Green Mountains of Vermont actually have a lot of biomass. The Allegheny looks pretty good, and parts of the Adirondacks look, look pretty good. Um, so that's the nature of the resource for much of the analysis that we will present. So I want to just start by um, just reviewing the extent of the forest land base. Um, and I don't think this will come as much as of a surprise to you, but, but it's important to start with. Um, and this is just map, a map from uh, one of the national databases, the USGS land cover. This is a satellite-derived coverage. And, and it gives you a sense of, of where the major forest regions are. But we actually rely uh, even more on the FIA um, data on forest land. And, and there's a lot of information in this table. But there, there won't be a lot of surprises here that, I, um, although perhaps uh, I'm going to find the arrow here if I can. You'll, you'll see that slightly over two-thirds of the, the land, the terrestrial surface of those northeastern states, is in what, the, what FIA would call forest land. This is um, their broader definition than, than commercial forest, their timberland definition. <laughs> but what, frankly, most people would consider um, forests. Now, this includes land that may not have much in the way of tree biomass on it at the moment, but is capable of supporting forest and is not in some other use. Maybe, um, you know, by way of perspective, a um, hundred years ago, this number would have been vastly lower when agricultural land was much more common and before we had begun to really 
seriously abandon agricultural land and, and allow forest land to regrow. I, I live in Dutchess County, New York, and 100 years ago, Dutchess County was only 16% forest land. Uh, it's now right at this regional average, right at a little over 60% forest. Now, there's, there's been some hope that this number might continue to increase, but, but the most recent analyses that have been done suggest that we're probably at a high water watermark. Um, given other pressures on the land, it's hard to see this number increasing much at, at a regional scale. The other thing to note here is that um, the amount of reserved forest land, this is land that is legally protected, is actually quite small. Uh, this, um, and, and as a New Yorker, I'm, I'm proud to say that the bulk, two-thirds of the protected forest land is actually in our constitutionally protected um, uh, forest preserve. Um, so while New York has the greatest forest land acreage, we also have the largest percentage that's not available for harvest. And, and, uh, and the lion's share of reserved forest land in the region. So it's not the case that um, there is a, a, a fairly large acreage of land that is legally reserved uh, for harvest in this region. But there are all sorts of other factors that do limit the available land base. And, and in our report, we go over those in some detail because I think Thomas and I would both agree that this is one of the greatest areas of uncertainty in the amount of resource available. And that is just how much land uh, in practical terms and given market conditions um, and public attitudes, how much land is actually available for harvest. And so uh, this slide summarizes some of the varied constraints on, on, the, on those, uh, the legal restrictions, uh, physical site restrictions. For instance, um, there are various kinds of constraints on whether or not you can harvest in wetlands. Um, and certainly there are some constraints on uh, the degree to which you can harvest on very steep slopes. Um, there are economic constraints on harvesting when you're uh, farther than some distance from the nearest improved road. And then the bottom two are the real wild cards, I guess. Um, and those are um, the increasing fragmentation of our forest land base into smaller parcels. This has been well documented and happens throughout the region. And then, and then the, the question of just what are the interests of landowners? Um, there's a lot of work on this subject. Um, but still a lot of uncertainty about, um, for instance, uh, at what point might landowners uh, be willing, uh, who aren't currently willing to harvest, to consider a harvest? Is it, is it driven by economics? Is it driven by a recognition that there can be social benefits to allowing the harvest? Um, there's just an awful lot of uncertainty in exactly how much of that land is available. And Thomas will come back to this at the end when we try to actually come up with uh, scenarios for biomass supply under different assumptions in these categories. Um, but let me just take uh, one aside. There's been an awful lot of talk about whether there may be a large land base available for um, use in, uh, uh, that's, that's essentially fallow land now that could be used for intensive biofuel woody crops. I have to say, I, this is not something we address in the report, but I think you should, you should think carefully about that if you're in that business. Um, much of the land that you might think of as fitting in that category is already considered to be forest. And um, certainly uh, may not have uh, uh, all that much biomass on it yet, but from a land use point of view, it's already been counted in the forest land base. And I see there are some questions, but I think I'm going to try to uh, take some of these questions all at the end, if, if that's OK. So I want to turn now to the condition of that forest land. We have you know, 2 thirds of the landscape is in, in, in forest or can support forest. Um, but what's the nature of the forest on that land? And, and again and again, I hear this assumption not just from the public, but from even from forestry professionals um, that, well, we logged all these forests 100 years ago, and they're now mature. And, um, uh, and ready to be harvested again. And, and um, one corollary of that is that the a presumption is that their rates of growth and carbon sequestration 
are declining and, and that um, by uh, putting them back into harvest we can increase their rates of growth. Um, um, but I want to point out that that this is a very common sight from the air. There's, um, as I'll lay out in some detail in a few minutes, th there's an awful lot more harvesting going on than the public is aware of. Um, so for instance, this is a slightly busy graph, but it's a histogram of the plots for these different groups of states and uh, showing uh, whether they have um, you know, their low biomass plots or whether they're high biomass plots. So old growth or ma mature forest would be out here at about 200 metric tons per hectare. Um, and as you'll see, none of these states or groups of states um, have an awful lot of, of what an ecologist would call a, a, an old growth forest or a truly mature forest um, that has reached the peak of biomass. And in fact, states like Maine with, with very active harvesting have the bulk of their land clustered at low biomass. Um, and you'll see some significant differences among the, these, these groups of states in, in um, uh, the distribution of biomass across the landscape. So um, what I've done here is um, we took the data from FIA and we fit functions for biomass increment as a function of biomass um, for these different groups of states. And what you'll see is that in, in each region, at some point, um, you reach a biomass where, on average, the forest stops uh, accumulating biomass. Th this almost has to happen at some point. You'll see that, the, the for instance, Maine uh, uh, forests reach that point at a much lower biomass than forests in, say, Pennsylvania and New York. And even more to the point, the forests in Pennsylvania and New York reach a peak of, of net growth at, a, at both a higher level and at, at um, a higher biomass <coughs> excuse me, than forests in Maine. I suspect that this is just a, due to a combination of differences in soils and climate. Um, and so rather than that the forests have, have reached a point and that they're all out here and have stopped growing, in fact, if you look at the histogram up here and compare it with, with the biomass increment function, um, the current landscape in the Northeast turns out to be very close to optimal in terms of its regional productivity. Um, that could change over time, but frankly, it changes very slowly. And so, um, you know, I think this is, this is, uh, this is very good news. Um, you know, we have a, a very productive landscape out there. Um, but I want to turn now to just a quick summary of silvicultural systems and, uh, in, the, in the Northeast. And, and again, um, I, th I think there is still a, a, a fairly a significant public perception that clear cutting is widely practiced in the Northeast. Um, it turns out that, that in reality, uh, while even age management is still practiced, it's actually must, much less common. Uh, then even, frankly, I, I think a lot of professionals uh, realize um, and that partial harvests have become the norm. Um, but there is some important regional variation in both the frequency and intensity of harvests. And, and so I want to just show you a, a, um, a, a, the basic results from a fairly detailed analysis we've done of the FIA data to characterize regional harvest regimes. Basically, when they measure a plot, they record whether the tree it was removed, quote unquote. That basically means do they find evidence that it was harvested. Um, we took those data and then fit, a, a, frankly, a somewhat complicated statistical model to estimate two things. First, what is the probability that a plot will be logged as a function of how much biomass was there? And second, um, what was the probability or what fraction of basal area was removed if the plot was logged. And I just want to show you the results of that analysis because they're a little bit surprising. The first is, is um, if, if uh, traditional even age management were being practiced, then you would expect these curves to be flat and then at some point to trend upward quite sharply. In other words, you wouldn't harvest a stand until it had some minimal level, but minimum but high level of biomass. 
and and in in fact that's not really what's happening there is harvesting going on even in in many stands that have relatively low biomass now this may be that it's the the second cut from a shelter wood cut um, or uh, for whatever reason there are um, there certainly is an increase in the likelihood that a stand is harvested when it has more biomass but it's not a step function um, but this result is even more striking. These are the these are the means. Now there's enormous variation from in any one operation from one site to another. But in fact, in in the New England states, um, the mature stands actually typically are are high graded. They're really um, and and if you talk to foresters in my neck of the woods, this is actually the thing that that. Uh, is, is most upsetting. There's an awful lot of, of uh, light partial harvesting happening in our most mature forests, uh, but when you go in and you look at the harvest, it's it's um, it, it's basically high grading, and, and that really shows up in the southern New England states, I have to say. Um, whereas in New York and Pennsylvania, the mean is flat. It just it um, you know they're just as likely to take 30 percent of the basal area out of a stand with low biomass as out of a stand with high biomass. Now. There are points all the way. There are stands that are that are uh, clear cut. There are stands that have only um, a few trees taken. But but the point here is that there is an awful lot of partial harvesting taking place. You know, these are for all sorts of reasons. I, I I suspect it mostly has to do with markets and with technology being available to make partial harvesting um, uh, practical and and frankly good silviculture now when it wasn't so easy to do this 50 years ago. But this is a, you know, again and again, I, I I run into people, both professionals and the public, who who perceive a very different practice on the land. And I think this is one of the reasons why I think um, there is a public perception that there's not that much harvesting going on, because they tend to, um, uh, if there's a clear cut, they recognize it. If it's a partial harvest, um, unless they're paying attention and see the landings, they don't they don't register that a forest has been been harvested. So given that this harvest is happening, how much more could we potentially get, um, and how close are we to sustainable levels now? And so this is another case where the perception and the reality are a bit at odds. I think even among forest professionals, there's a sense that our current har harvest levels are still quite a bit below uh, sustainable yield, and that there is a large unused resource out there. Um, uh, I have to say this was the, the most depressing part of our uh, results. Um, we certainly have a large and healthy stock of tree biomass on the landscape, um, but harvest rates, particularly during the, the, the very intense uh, periods in the uh, over the last decade uh, before 2008, um, turn out to be fairly close to um, uh, sustainable levels, and so that's what I want to to show you a table of numbers, and uh, there's a lot of detail here, but I, and it didn't, <laughs> sorry, I have my apologies for the uh, odd um, formatting of this. Take a look over here. So these are the data from FIA by state for net growth, which is um, growth, absolute growth of trees minus this mortality, the natural mortality, and then over here are the removals. And then this is, this is, I suppose, the column that I want you to focus on, which is um, removals as a percent of net growth. Um, and you know, there certainly are states like uh, New Hampshire and New York, uh, Pennsylvania, where current removals are well below net growth, um, around half. But there are also states like Maine where over the five-year period from 2003 to 2008, um, they were removing more than the net growth. And then states like Connecticut, where it's also very close. And, and so um, you know, I think this has to be a concern. And Thomas is going to um, go into this in more detail in a minute. Um, uh, but over the region as a whole, we're already taking about uh, six, a little over 60% of the net growth in removals. And I have to point out that very little of this number is uh, is being uh, used in biomass energy. This really represents the um, you know the traditional forest products, and so there's 
you know, the bottom line here is that the traditional forest products industry is already using a significant fraction of the available resource. And I just want to end my part of this with, with an illustration of this. This is just a plot showing in blue the, the, the most recent censuses, uh, census data from you know, late uh, uh, around 2008 versus the census five years earlier, five to seven years earlier. Um, by state. And you can see both Maine and Connecticut are actually not increasing anymore and in fact are slightly declining. And, and so, um, and the other states are still increasing but only slightly. So there's, there's a real caution there and I'm going to uh, stop there and turn this over to Thomas. Thank you, Charlie, for um, presenting this first part. Can you hear me? Can someone chat, um, put in the chat, please, if they can hear me, just to make sure? OK, thanks. Perfect. So thank you, Charlie, for um, presenting this first part of the, of the webinar. Um, my section in this study was to take these numbers from Charlie now on um, biomass availability um, based on this FIA data set and think about how much of that would become available when you look at um, biophysical constraints and um, social constraints, as Charlie has already mentioned before, um, when you include also reserved lands, when you include slopes and, and wetlands that may not be accessible, as well as um, social issues like willingness to harvest or parcelization of land. And in the second step, we then use these numbers that we generated to look at how much of the current energy portfolio of the Northeast um, can actually be replaced um, by biomass, or what dent could it make into into the um, portfolio if you want to replace fossil fuels? So what we did was we um, developed several um, biomass supply scenarios that I want to introduce to you um, quickly. Um, it was yeah, three scenarios in total. Um, the first scenario was that we would assume that um, no additional harvest would be made, but that the paper industry would um, basically leave the Northeast for good and that this biomass would become available um, for energy production. The second scenario was that we assumed the paper industry would keep um, running um, and would, would be in place. Um, however, we would um, perform additional new harvests of, um, especially for, just specifically for um, biomass harvest. Um, this would be additional to current harvest levels to tap into this net growth that Charlie has outlined before. And the third scenario actually combined those two numbers. I want to briefly introduce you now you to these three scenarios and the assumptions, then present numbers, and then we go into the, to the uh, fossil fuel replacement scenarios. The scenario A, where we assumed that the pulp mills would close down, um, was well, the assumptions for the scenario was that we would divert all the current pulp, um, pulp biomass into energetic use. There would be no change in um, in the mix of forest products. There would be an additional um, stream of biomass coming from a more efficient um, use of logging residues that are currently not recovered. 50% of those that would right now stay in the forest would come, um, would be would be additional to what's currently going to the paper industry. That was scenario A. Scenario B, new harvest, so is that we assumed um, that there would be no change in the current mix of forest products as it's cut right now. Um, we would have 50% of the tops removed that currently stay in the forest from conventional harvest as they happen right now, as well as from new harvest that would tap into current net growth. Um, the other thing that you need to consider is if you would um, perform additional new harvests, um, not all of the biomass that you would get out of the forest would um, be available to biomass for energetic use. There would be also a considerable um, proportion that would um, yield higher revenues in the timber market and you would not consider to have 
let's say, veneer balls being chipped and burned for electricity or heat production. So that would need to be subtracted. And then we had um, to consider also restrictions on available land. And we had a couple of different constraints that I will categorize here. One was a legal constraint. Um, Charlie mentioned already that roughly 6% of the forest land is um, reserved and therefore excluded for additional harvest. The other constraint, the other constraint was a physical constraint. And here we started to work now with ranges, with a low range and with a high range, because it's becoming increasingly fuzzy how to 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 put numbers on these um, on these constraints. So physical constraints were exclusion of wetlands with a low boundary. We assumed that there would be no logging in wetlands, and with a high boundary, we assumed that 50% of forests um, in wetlands would be um, harvested. Same with slopes. We assumed that for a low boundary that no login on steep slopes would um, occur and a high um, boundary would be that half of those steep slopes would be available for logging in the future. Um, economic constraints included distance to roads and parcelization. Um, we assumed that there would be a correlation between um, the distance of a stand to a road and how likely it would be would be locked. Um, if it would be over a mile, um, we would, in the low boundary, would assume that no, this this um, segment would not be locked. With the high boundary, we assume that half of those remote stands would be locked. And um, the stands that are, that have a distance of over a mile are something like 7.7% um, of the land um, that is um, active that is actually um, open for for um, timber management. Parcelization is another big wild card. Um, we assume that for the low scenario, no logging would happen in parcels under 10 percent under 10 acres, and 50 percent of the parcels over 20 acres would be available for logging. And in the high scenario, um, we would assume that 50 percent of those parcels below 10 acres would be logged and all the parcels above 10 acres. And the last part that's, that's really tough to, um, to quantify were social constraints in terms of unwillingness to, to log. Um, we assume that 10% of the unreserved forest land would be unavailable in a low scenario, in a high scenario, that 5% of the remaining unreserved forest land would be unavailable. unavailable excuse me. <coughs> So a bunch of assumptions that um, could be discussed. We can perhaps talk about this later also in the discussion. Um, but the question was how much they would actually make a dent into the um, final estimate of biomass and how these the this added effect of all these constraints would um, change um, the overall estimate. So what I want to do now is to show you in a graph very briefly on how we, how the proportions would work out in these in these different assumptions. What you see here now is basically taken now from the um, the results from Charlie and his work. Um, we have a certain amount of forest growth. Part of that is net growth um, because um, another something like a third of it is um, will be lost due to um, natural mortality. So. The net growth is what we have currently in our forest and what we can work with in in future. Um, what's currently happening is something like, I think Charlie mentioned the number of 60% of our current removals of the net growth. So the other 40% are the current net change. And this is now <clears throat> the amount of biomass that we could work on if we would assume, as you can see here in the title, um, how much biomass we would get out of the forest from additional new harvests. And I um, use here the scenario below that is um, more conservative on the social constraints and biophysical constraints like wetland slopes, willingness to harvest, and so on. Um, if you look at what's happening with these current removals right now is that you have a large chunk, something like 80% is um, actually extracted from the, from the forest. Um, here you see the secondary biomass market that goes through this extraction from saw timber and pulp 
and ends up in the biomass market, this is not what we considered in our study. This is already happening. So we were looking at additional um, growth potential. However, what we were looking at is here yeah, the logging residues. There's something like 20% of logging residues left in the forest, and we assume that 50% of this might be additionally um, available for biomass to energy. So this is a chunk of biomass that we considered in our study. And again, um, we tried in this graph um, we tried in this graph to um, make these bars proportionally to their size in the in the forest. So, and this is now what um, what we are talking about in the new harvest scenario. You have the current net change, and the question is how much of that could become available for biomass harvest. Um, as I tried to point out in the previous slides, is that there are already a bunch of assumptions that would reduce um, the availability by something like a third. See, there's a section of um, here the reserved land, hydric sites, deep slopes, road access, unwillingness to harvest small parcels, tops retained in the in the forest. So if you would add all this together you have already a third of the current net change that's basically unavailable to you even if you would want to um, uh, be pretty aggressive, aggressive in additional harvest. Then there's another section of high value wood. If you do these harvests again, not all of the biomass that you would harvest would end up on your biomass pile as there might be also valuable timber in there. And we assumed that the um, proportion of high value wood would be the same as, um, what's, as, as what you um, expect from current harvests. So another something like a third would not be available for your um, energetic use of biomass, which leaves you with this last third, um, roughly, perhaps 25 percent, and that would become available for biomass. So this gives you an overview on on the proportions of a an additional cut and how much biomass you can get out of this. And in the next slide, um, we put numbers on these um, on these segments. What you see here now is again the three scenarios. Scenario A, no pulp mills in the future, but no additional harvest. Then the scenario B is additional harvest with low estimates and high estimates. And the scenario C um, combines both scenarios. And what you see here now in numbers down here is that we assume that something between 4 million and 15 million of um, dry tons, metric tons, um, might be available in the in the northeast. Again, these two numbers here would assume that the pulp mills would close down. These two numbers here um, assume that they will keep operating and um, only new harvests will um, be performed and will um, provide new material to for bioenergy use. Um, we used this number of four million or four point two million for our um, for our next steps in the estimates because we assume that this is probably the most realistic one and also the most conservative one um, to to err on the safe side for biomass estimates um, with our study. What you also see is that there are rather big differences in how much biomass is available by state. Also interesting here is when you look at main we had here something like 4.5 million um, dry tons of biomass become available if the pulp mills would um, cease to exist. This is the same number as the combined scenario. The reason for that is that Maine, as you might remember from Charlie's slide, is already um, above harvesting um, beyond its net growth, annual net growth. So there would be no new um, harvest available. Um, however, there might be additional harvests available, might be additional biomass available from a more efficient recovery of um, logging residues. So now we produce basically these numbers: how much biomass we can get from the forest from different, <coughs> excuse me, from different. Uh, looking at different scenarios, the next question now was what then can this make into a um, fossil fuel 
portfolio that we have right now. And for that, we um, got numbers from the Energy Information Administration on um, liquid fossil fuel use, basically all kinds of products from petroleum, from oil, and coal use. And what you see here is how the different states, how much energy they consume in oil and coal. Coal is always the blue one here. And in what um, segments they use it, in what segments of consumption. It's um, transport as well as heating applications in residential, commercial, and industrial use, and then other use of LFS, of um, liquid fossil fuels. What's interesting here is that many states use a large chunk um, of their oil for heating applications. The highest is actually for Maine when you combine the residential, commercial, industrial use in Maine, 40 percent of its imported oil go into the sector. Across the whole um, region, this was in the range of 20 percent of the oil that is not burned on for transport but for heat heating applications. So we developed um, now different scenarios where we thought they could be more or less realistic um, over short to medium um, term and or short to long term, um, depending on different technology that would be applied and also depending on different um, use scenarios that would be applied. So some of these scenarios we're focusing on electricity production, um, like this one and this one and here as well. Other scenarios would focus just on, on heat production from biomass in the commercial and industrial sector or in the residential sector. And then um, what we label the medium to long-term scenarios, we're actually aiming at um, replacing transport fuels with biomass. We, um, these technologies are not um, commercially available yet, and um, that's why we um, put them in the long to uh, medium to long-term range. And here diesel or gasoline would be replaced in the other parts, it would be mainly heating oil types, the current electricity mix, or coal. These different scenarios um, have different substitution factors. Um, it is, uh, if you would replace coal, you could replace nearly one ton of coal with one ton of biomass to um, produce the same amount of energy. Um, this is different, of course, if you would look at very complicated scenarios of um, replacing um, gasoline. There you would more think in the range of something like 0.2 tons of gasoline being replaced by one ton of um, biomass. And that, of course, um, influences also afterwards the efficiencies of these replacement scenarios. Um, so I am presenting now a couple of results. If you are interested in how these results were produced, I um, recommend you to, to look at the study. Um, we'll have a link to the study again on the last slide. Um, what, we um, what we found was that um, if you would use these 4.2 million metric tons of um, biomass in the Northeast, that's the assumption um, from New harvest and the low estimate is that you could replace up to 6% of the coal that's used in the Northeast. Or, and that's the important part, this is an or function. Um, it's not, we, we look at each segment by itself and assume that all the biomass would be channeled into the segment. So, or we could provide 4 to 6% of its total electricity mix, as same as here, but an additional 14% of the potential oil. Um, could be replaced if you would use um, combined heat and power technologies. And again, or if all the biomass, all the 4.2 million tons would be channeled into um, the commercial and heating sector, industrial heating sector, you could replace 28 percent of the um, heating oil that's used there, or you could replace 16 percent um, of all the heating oil that's used in residential heating. And the last segment, you could replace 5 or 2 percent of the current highway diesel or gasoline consumption if this technology would become available. Um, if you look at the overall energy portfolio, if you are interested, what then can we make with biomass in, in our overall energy portfolio, including everything, electricity production, um, transportation, heating homes, and the industry, uh, um, industrial 
needs for energy. We um, assumed the most efficient way to use this biomass, um, which is a high efficiency um, combined heat and power application with up to 40% of electric efficiency. This is not really commercially available to this point, but um, a lot of technology um, development is happening right now, and this might become available in the medium future. And what you see here is for these different scenarios, um, scenarios B for new harvests, or scenario C, um, adding the pulp biomass and the new harvest together, you would be in the range of something like 1.4 percent to 5.5 percent um, of the energy that could be provided from biomass um, in the totally total um, energy cake of the Northeast. <clears throat> and just as a last slide to put this now in, again, in a, in a meaningful way by a state, I have just this example of Vermont here. And Vermont um, uses something like 12 million um, barrels of oil every year, um, which means it's something like 1.1 billion um, tons leave the state annually. Um, our results suggest that something like 200,000 dry tons um, of biomass would be available for, um, for energy use if you would assume new harvests in Vermont, um, and that could replace something like 13 percent of this currently used heating oil um, in Vermont. Um, this is a little bit in contrast and, and contradicting current policy goals the Vermont policy goal of the 25 by 25 initiative um, suggests a doubling of the biomass share, um, which would be way beyond the 200,000 um, that is that we think is a realistic estimate, as alone the biomass plant in Vermont, the McNeil power plant, 50 megawatts already consumes 300,000. And there's also a new Vermont energy plan under public review right now that's um, assuming something in the range of 800,000 dry tons per year. So just to close this, this is the slide that um, has some closing thoughts on Charlie's um, presentation. Um, there is a abundant resource in the Northeast, but it's already in heavy use. The current mix of forests is close to optimal terms, so um, for, um, assuming that a longer rotation age or um, a, a change in forest structure would increase our availability is probably not appropriate. Um, there's certainly a need for a better understanding on how forest land is currently harvested and what conditions. And then we also need to keep in mind that um, these unpredictable events like beetle outbreaks or um, storms might um, reduce the availability of additional harvest, which means that if you would assume that you want to harvest your full net growth, 100% of your net growth every year, you might um, get into negative if one of these events occurs. And from my side of the analysis, um, I think that the forest biomass can play a, a role in the Northeast energy portfolio, though the potential is often overestimated, I think there needs to be a lot of effort in um, efficiency and energy use reduction measures, and that could also then bring the overall share of biomass a little bit up just by reducing the total size of the energy portfolio. Another thing that needs to be considered is that biomass is not really local anymore, so the question is what sense, what's the rationale actually to make a statewide assumption on biomass um, availability or even a regional scale. Um, there is biomass of wood chips actually from Brazil being shipped to the Midwest um, by now. 30 percent of the biomass that's imported to the Netherlands or that's actually used in the Netherlands comes from North America. So this is becoming a global market and the question is how this will um, affect um, state policies in the Northeast. And the last point I want to make is um, that it's very difficult to actually estimate the CO2 emissions that come from additional harvest. This is a big topic that um, is actually being tackled right now by the Environmental Protection Agency. And if you're interested in that, um, Charlie and I can also answer questions. So, and now um, 
we open this up for discussion. Thank you very much. And I also want to mention again that this was funded by the Environmental Defense Fund and the co-author was Steve Hamburg. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much uh, to both Charles and Thomas. Uh, it looks like some people are already typing in some questions. Uh, so if uh, you do have a question, please go ahead and type that in the chat pod and we'll let the speakers go ahead and uh, respond to them with the time that we have left. Uh, Dan, this is Charlie. Um, there was a question about West Virginia, and I, I think there were two. Uh, I think that person has left. The uh, we needed to make some arbitrary decisions about the scope of the study, and uh, and also the FIA data for West Virginia were not available. Um, uh, the most recent census data had not been posted at the time of this, and uh, they're still working on those. So there were practical and and just somewhat arbitrary reasons for that. Um, there's also a question from Norman Pattison about uh, the the real practical limitations here, and and uh, uh, I, uh, I think he's right on on those. The, there are all sorts of other limitations that we have not considered. We were just trying to, to get a handle on what could potentially uh, be available if all of these others, um, uh, the, the more sort of human and economic side, could be handled. Thomas, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with what, what you said, Charlie, and I agree also with um, this comment on the logger workforce that is declining. Um, I, we are very aware of this situation, um, and what we try to get here, we, we um, know that these new harvests are not happening right now due to the economic constraints and the price that's paid for biomass. Um, our question was here really on, on is there an additional, is there a biophysical um, potential <laughs> to, to provide more biomass? And if a state, for example, feels like and they should um, incentivize this harvest, would that actually yield additional harvest? So if, if there's a certain amount of dollars paid for each ton delivered, if this could actually change, uh, make a significant change. So these, we are aware of these um, situations. Um, let me uh, respond to Dan's first question about the growth curves. Um, I've done a lot of resource uh, research on um, trying to manage spacing of trees and stands to minimize competition, and, and uh, our results show that there's a lot of potential. If in an ideal world in which you managed for particular mixes of species and spacing to increase uh, yield by in the range of 25, 30 percent. I have to say, in, in practice, um, that, that assumes a, a, a level of precision in harvest that, that I think is quite rare. Um, there's an awful lot of land being managed by TMOs on a very short time horizon. And doing something to increase yield over the next 20 years, I have to say, I don't see that being a, a dominant factor in the design of harvests. I think current market conditions uh, tend to drive uh, harvest selection more than anything else. So um, I'll let, I'll let uh, Thomas respond to the others. So um, to answer Dan's question on 50% of tops, um, what we did not assume that 50% of the tops are not currently harvested. What we assumed is and that we got numbers on um, logging residue that's left in the woods. And um, we assumed that with additional <laughs> as um, pointed out by some listeners here, with perhaps additional economic incentives or uh, a change in, in technology, 50% of those logging residues that are currently left in the woods would potentially become available. So that's the 50% number that we, that we had in our presentation. Um, perhaps I can also comment on the second question um, that loggers won't harvest biomass except as a byproduct for roundwood. This is becoming, of course, also another big um, economic issue um, if sawmills and pulp mills are leaving the region, how this biomass will become available if the, the main source of income is actually um, is, is 
falling apart. Um, again, what we try to do here is to get an idea on what the potential is, what's out there, what is a realistic assumption that we could harvest from these forests without destroying them. The second question, of course, as you mentioned here, is a much more difficult one to answer. What are the, what, what economic conditions do you need to make this actually happen? Um, and I think this is then a, a question that really needs to be answered in the political arena and that hopefully can use our results to get an idea what the overall potential is that they could tap into if the economic situation is, is favorable. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, Thomas, do you have an answer for Mark? <laughs> Yeah, we um, we um, did assume, or we did include the energy content of wood. Um, in our case, we um, took a uh, average of 20 gigajoule um, of energy content for each ton of wood. If you use the tonnage rather than the volume, um, you have a fairly constant um, energy content for different species. Um, so we have included this difference between hardwoods and softwoods. 